It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org from Louisville Public Media. Absolutely. Absolutely. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence, and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here, checking out the series. Uh, Please do hit that subscribe button while you're hanging around. In fact, you do that, I'll give you three brand new interviews every single week, new and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to keep you up to date on your favorite artists and discover some new ones at iTunes and Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Podchaser. NPR, YouTube for the video versions, or anywhere you get your podcast from. Subscribe to Kyle Meredith with, and that's me, Kyle Meredith, today talking with my one of my musical heroes, uh, the Cults in Astbury. We're going to be discussing the new record, uh, Under the Midnight Sun. Uh, he's going to talk about coming up as a crooner during the uh, post-punk era, how journalists mistakenly uh, lumping them in with hair metal and living through the optics of nostalgia, as he says. Uh, we're also going to talk about some of the big influences on the album, including Brian Jones, uh, late of the uh, Rolling Stones, uh, William S. Burroughs, Jack Kerouac and the Beats. And he's also going to dive into the ecological and environmental moments that arrive throughout. So we're going to get his takes on recent artists like Eve's Tumor and how they're part of this uh, really bigger lineage of musicians that thread around Nico and the Velvet Underground and Andy Warhol and Pablo Picasso, too. All that and so much more. So enjoy this conversation. We're talking Under the Midnight Sun. It's Kyle Meredith with Ian Astbury of The Cult. Hi, Kyle. Let me first let me tell you, the uh, the new album, Under the Midnight Sun, I love you guys. I love this band so much. I, I always get excited. I think I had even a heightened excitement this time, which can be, you know, a good setup for letdown. And you did not do that. This album is so damn good. Um, thank you. By the way, your voice sounds great, too. I mean, as strong as ever. I was looking back and, and just looking at my favorite vocalists. And, and they all seem to have this, you know, what do you call it? Like a crooner style, which I, I think you. Mm, you kind of in, yeah. Yeah. How did you, baritone. right. How did that develop? Because looking back and seeing that you all coming up sort of out of the punk world, I mean, it, that just had to feel so against the tide of the time. Not really. I mean, in Curtis, in Curtis was a baritone. You know, he was emulating the, what the lineage chain, everything from Paul Robes and through, the blues artist through Elvis Presley through, I mean, even Perry Como, you know, and then Scott Walker, Jim Morrison, there's a certain space, you know, but Sinatra, Sinatra Elvis, all of those singers, they're all kind of Corona baritone singers. I, I mean, I love Serge Gainsbourg. I love Scott Walker. I loved everybody. I mean, at one point I was really in love with Peter Gabriel, uh, but that's a completely different vocal register. Did you find that, um, did you find that you had to develop it in any way or, or, or was that pretty natural then? I was, um, I never had any formal training. Well, that, that's not true. I, I was in school choir when I was a kid, but I was only very short spurts of time. I was in school choir when I was about 10. But after that, I didn't really, there wasn't any school choirs or anything. I, I took music class, but probably singing to records was, you know, sing along with records, that's probably where it evolved from. And plus, my parents were really, they had a few crooners in the room. Uh, Johnny Mathis, my mother loved Johnny Mathis. Uh, My father loved Paul Robes, and he loved Deep Southern Gospel. You know, we were hearing, they always had a pretty good record collection, my parents. So I was able to pick through that as a kid. And then I got a radio really early on. I was just a European radio. Um, It was pirate radio, so we're getting all this kind of eclectic, more eclectic music the early 70s and then I guess when I came to North America as a kid I was 11 going to Canada all of a sudden my world opened it was like FM radio music from New York State it was pretty profound so it's always been around me and I think because of that it's just something I've done naturally since I was a kid well I love yeah just the way it's developed through the years and just the the way you kind of carry on you know, on top of sometimes some very abrasive rock sounds, you know, uh, I mean, it's, that's such, yeah. it should be a contrast, you know, 
some it shouldn't work i guess i mean it has for as you know all these artists that you're talking about it has for 50 60 70 years but but yeah a lot of those a lot of those are individual performers um you know i mean as well so it's kind of unique i mean perhaps with the exception of morrison um playing with the doors but uh when you're in a collaboration the cult of collaboration really Mm-hmm. I don't even know it's a band. It's a collaboration between Billy and I, and we both have very different points of view and musical points of view. And um, where we meet is where the cult really works. So, you know, I might do vocal. I'll be the same vocalist, but in a different context. You'd hear me in different contexts, like with, um, with On Call, for example. Those songs are much more crooned out. And um, I think on this record, I put two pieces of music in there, Vendetta X, and I threw Butterfly Heart. So... I already have my vocal cadence set for that. Um, a few of the songs, some of the choices, you know, not singing hysteronics. <laughs> Trying to keep the hysteria out of it. And all the, you know, the kind of, the inflections I would have used or, or um, when I was a kid, I, in my 20s, we called him Rick Rubin or whatever. I would have been completely different. I was a different person. And I, I, I honestly feel, I mean, I've tried, tried to be conscious of evolving you know, I wouldn't say, oh, yeah, I, I don't pay attention to what I do, but I actually pay a lot of attention to what I do. And I try out different music. I try out different songs. I try and learn other music and other songs and other genres and work in other genres, which is more the intention going forward is to be able to do a lot of the projects that I've been offered over the years that definitely are not cult-centric. You know, that, that's interesting then, you know, hearing how you talk about your styles and especially through the years and, and, and different projects, because I think it was one of the earlier interviews about this record with with Billy. And, and he was saying that, you know, for him, this this record had impressions of like love and dream time, like the earliest versions of cult. Like, I don't know if you felt that same way, but but if so, vocally, does that have you going back to a certain spot then? Couldn't. Different age, different diaphragm, different. Right. It's anatomically different. Like probably almost impossible to. <laughs> but in terms of te- in terms of a textural, there's definitely a turn to dark, gothic, futurist, romanticist, textured, considered. You know, I mean, Billy's using the White Falcon in a way that's to create a soundscape, and it's not used as a weapon of aggression. You know, the guitars in a lot of you know people always assume guitar should be played at volume 11 well sometimes it's better if you play it at three and you get the tone so the tone's really important and um i i feel that in many ways the up until 1984 you know we were in a i guess that pre pre mtv moment um when we depended upon pretty much radio a little bit of tv but it's mostly word of mouth on the record stores, right? It's a completely different time. And there was, there was way more of an underground scene happening. You know, there's a lot more discovery. You had to go, you couldn't just go on Spotify and look at a playlist and then discover everything all in one go. You had to dig through record record bins. You had to ask, you had to ask your friends. I mean, was, so I feel that in this way, because a lot of the music I was, I was listening to during this period, I was listening to uh, like Moody Mokhtar, I was listening to, you know, the music from um, Explosion from the Sub-Saharan scene, which is incredible. And a lot of drone, everything from Black Rider to Sun. I was can, a lot of can. Um, in fact, you know, Amandul, not so much Amandul, probably more like Purple Vu. And, um, you know, bits of doors, to be honest with you. You know, the doors really were able to get into that space. It was a completely different space than just writing a rock song. You know what I mean? <laughs> Rock! I, I mean, the cult have been critiqued to being, well, you guys were, you were hair man. You guys had hair. Well, yes, we had hair. But if you notice, who, is, who had us the hair first? And secondly, <laughs> my hair was straight. I never, I, I never puffed it out, boofed it out. And then we got to the point where we went, well, this is, this is pretty much done. Everybody's in the room now. Heads got shaved. We didn't sit around. In fact, Billy was the first to shave his head. I eventually shaved mine about ninety four. It's like that was so cathartic and so cleansing to do that. It's almost like we we do not associate with this at all. And um, 
it's amazing when people in super me go like so you know you guys are checking out the like the motley crew tour with mm. devs it's like excuse me i i don't even know how you can use this band in the same sentence the cult shouldn't even be the same and that's and that's said with all respect because they do what they do and but um you know but we're doing we're lifers i mean i'm a lifer I'm, i'll be doing this it's all i know it's what i love i love music touring hmm, can be very interesting i never i always thought of you guys more in the and i was just broadly and and to say the alternative scene from that time but there's that line there's yeah, a line we're, if, we're the counter narrative that's for sure i mean we're all with the counter narrative you always get asked, asked the assumed questions and i'm always nope <laughs> that's a, that's an assumption there's a lot of us uh, you know assumptions about the cult but well, that's that, that line in A Cut Inside. I mean, is it does that speak to that at all when you say, I don't want to be caught up in your scene, outsiders forever? Yeah. Bang on. That's a 17-year-old that's a right there saying, I don't want to be part of that click. Please please don't associate me with it. Yeah, yeah. totally. What is the, uh, what, that, the, the follow-up line there, Ghost of Our Lives? What does that reference? Uh, Which one? Oh, the Ghost of Our Lives? Yeah. Um, nostalgia. Yeah. You know, live, living through an op the optics of nostalgia constantly. Well, especially when you're, it's, it's, it's actually, you know, consider for us, was constantly thrust upon us. You know, you're defined by what you did in 1980. Sometimes I get defined by what I did in the Southern Death Call, you know, um, or even working with the doors. So Ghost of Our Lives is really a, a reference to nostalgia. And it's the phrase that came up, it's the phrase that fits, and that's what I'm referencing is there's a consciousness about nostalgia, not operating from a nostalgic point of view, but when somebody's trying to make sense of you, they're always going to use things they know or reference points they know, but ultimately I'm coming from a completely different perspective. Obviously, because being the principal creator, one of the principal creators of this, we're, on, we're inside of it, so we have a completely different, completely different perspective. And don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It's Kyle Meredith with Ian Astbury of The Cult. I did love hearing that line. And, and you know, maybe it was a press release or something. You know, when you're talking about just some of the other artists you had in mind and the beats come up, you know, Burroughs was in there. And I, I'm oh, yeah, such a big course. fan of them forever, too. I mean, I'm sitting right by stacks yeah. of their books, probably within yeah. short of circuit control. That was right. Burroughs' whole thing and Brian Geisen's whole thing. Short circuit control. Be the counter narrative, right. break it up, cut it up. And that's something that I've been, you know, I've obviously, I think the gateway to all of that really was, well, actually, the gateway was, was actually reading Jack Kerouac very early, early on. You know, I mean, like at 18, reading Kerouac, um, especially Dharma Bombs, Subterraneans, um, Big Sur, on the road, not, it's strangely on the road, not as much as that. Um, but, you know, Chris Thess is one of my favorite books, Kerouac, um, and his interest in Buddhism, and Ginsberg's interest in Buddhism, and Alan Watts' interest in Buddhism, and that whole moment where they were looking at different philosophies, different ideas, and different ways of seeing and perceiving, you know, Geisen's cut-up techniques, Morocco, Marrakesh, which actually led me and this record through into not only Burroughs and Geisen, but Brian Jones, and Brian Jones is this angelic Gabriel, who went and captured the music of the master musicians of Jujuka and brought it back. I mean, don't forget that the Rolling Stones did make Satanic, Satanic Majesty's Request. <laughs> right. And Satanic Majesty's Request, what an incredible title. That's worthy of its own, I mean, God, that's worth of its own, you know, wing of a museum or a, a, a 10 volume dissertation on the whole thing. Break it through. It's like, what? What are you guys talking about? What's going on here? Brian Jones with a sitar in his hand. Brian Jones at Monterey Park with Nico and uh, Jimi Hendrix, dressed in Moroccan robes. Brian Jones in Marrakesh with Geisen and Burroughs. What? How old was he then? About 25? You know, we forget our savants. We forget our unicorns. And I honestly feel Brian Jones has been overlooked uh, and deserves some real serious exploration. Because the, you think about the music he was bringing to the Stones then, and we have this music coming out of sub -Saharan, the sub-Saharan scene, uh, Sahil Sounds, I, I believe it's called Sahil or Sahil Sounds in Portland. They've been bringing in a lot of artists and musicians from Mali, Nigeria, and um, I'm actually performing on a Moroccan rug every night 
there's no everything it has a, a, a purpose and a frequency in this band you know there's an intention with everything there's an intention with every line there's an intention with every nuance i mean it all comes with intention and consciousness that's what and that's another why i feel we fall between the cracks in a lot of spaces people don't want to touch it you know it's mm, this is a bit we don't really understand what's going on here so we're just going to leave it over here you know it's a it's an anomaly we're normally in that way but by the same token no better than no less than we're no better than anybody we're no less than anybody we're just doing what we do and that's we're out here doing it now it almost makes sense because the first words we hear on this album am i right you're whispering forget what you know yeah forget what you know um which is again to do with nostalgia and pre-pandemic and certainly where we are in terms of polarized the polarization of society and environmental uh, or the geopolitical, social political. See, today, the uh, one of the north, I think it's in Scandinavia, one of the uh, pipelines that exploded with natural gas. Oh, right, right. It's, put, it's pushing so much um, into the ether. It ain't going to be good. <laughs> it's, it's not a good one. It's, it's almost like a nuclear event in an, for an environmental situation. So where do we go with that? Do you weave that into your, it's a rhetorical question. I mean, what, what did I do with it? I used it. It's all in the record. It's all in there. More should be revealed. There's a lot, there's, there's a few Easter eggs I threw around for, for fun, for people to look at various, uh, there's, there's, there's geo, there's the actual geo um, coordinates sprinkled out throughout the cult's uh, artwork. And it's down to the, you may or may not want to Google on that geo coordinate. Um, but if you do, it's, it's a, it's a clue. It's an insight. I'm not going to do all the work for God's sakes. No, I heard about that. Oh, no, I think somebody said on a, some part of your merch, even there was a, some coordinates that, uh, yeah. Well, geo coordinates to start putting that on. I was fascinated with Matt reading the kid. It was in the military when I was a kid and I was always loved maps. So I'm going through the Himalayas um, in Tibet, you know, you're looking at maps and I love looking at topography and maps. I, I don't know if that's a fetish or something. <laughs> well, I mean, and, 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 and sometimes, you know, it, it's not even hidden. I mean, you've got that line in there and give me mercy. I mean, the end of our species, like that's a heavy line. Just it's, the end of of it. it's the end of a species. Ah. So, and you could read it as, the end of our species but the end of a species happens every 15 minutes or something sure we're sure. watching i had a breakdown on tour about three days ago where i was just sitting there and i was looking at an ocean on a graphic image of a dolphin with a with a uh, blue whale and they were kind of like just hanging out together and i was looking at it and i just it, it just ripped me to rip me apart just rip me apart and then you get into then you come in cities where people are living on top of each other and the, the lack of consciousness the lack of self uh, sorry the the proliferation of self me i oh i don't care about what these guys you know we are we are we are so beyond even having the luxury of talking about polarized political views at that point, that's just, that is ghosts. You're talking about things that have already occurred. How is that possibly going to move it forward? And when you see the reality of what's going on and you travel, I think it's the perspective we get is because we travel so much. So you get to see certain, if you're, you're not feeling this, when you really ain't going to feel this, um, you travel around and you just see it reinforced and reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. And these polarized narratives reinforced lack of communication. Give me mercy in a new language. It's a pre, it's a plea. Give me mercy. And then for the record to basically end with, you know, for all the setup in that title track, you know, there, there ends up being a warning in that too, because, because that title track, it, it almost sounds like, you know, this Eden type of poetry that you're talking about, but then you say, and it'll all fade in time. <laughs> like, no, it's very, very Blake. Well, all does fit in time. Everything evolves. Everything's impermanent. And in our culture, we just want things to live forever. I mean, if you're dead, you get stuffed or you get a hologram made of you or whatever. Um, 
you know, or there's a certain narrative that's pushed by interested parties who want to sell a certain product or, you know, the way a lot of streaming services have been built, have been on the ghosts of, you know, uh, everyone who built it from, from day one, all the R&B artists, all the blues artists, all the uh, rock artists, all the hip hop artists. I mean, look at the mouth, look at the graveyard, look at the graveyard. It's incredible. And it just keeps, the machine just keeps on rolling. So this isn't a complaint, it's, it's purely an observation. I mean, and then take a leave it because most folks, they, you know, they're going to do what they're going to do anyway. You can just do you. The best possible thing is do you. It really is beautifully done. I mean, for the bleakness of everything we're talking about, you know, it's as, as far as rock and roll music goes, it's, a, you know, it's really beautifully done. Well, thank you very much. But in terms of bleakness, it's not so much bleakness as fact and truth and actually lived experience. So there's two choices. One is to put your head in the sand or one is to, to really think about, hmm, how can I contribute to give me a shovel, start digging. Where do I start digging? Where do I start? What should I be doing? I have a very limited time here. I mean, a lot of my, you know, ideas are, I guess, an evolution of spending nearly four years around Buddhist teachings and communities and, and, and indigenous teachings and communities as a principal influence source. I mean, watching the sunset on Everest or standing in the Potala Palace, being admonished by the Dalai Lama for being late, <laughs> um, sitting in sweat ceremonies, um, you get a different frequency, you get a different information, you get a different perspective and that's again it's neither better than nor less than it's just what's in in quiz i maybe because i was an immigrant kid i had to learn about my environment really quickly i mean i was an immigrant so i was actually an immigrant of a parent who was a refugee of world war ii so immigrant child of, <laughs> of a refugee parents i can identify with that i guess that was an authentic description because my father suffered terrible ptsd from being bombed um literally bombed you know and uh being a child and living through that my god you know, and that was inflicted inflicted upon us certainly in our household but so was the ho our whole community where i grew up um here it is you know so we're not that far from orwellian 1984 but that is the year the band was born crass referred to it as year zero uh, a lot happened in 84 the the la olympics the uh an incredible Ridley Scott commercial um, for the first Apple computer. Right. I remember that one. Yeah. 1984. I mean, it's just after Blade Runner, but it's a sweet spot. It's a real sweet spot. And we got off to play in the opening day of the Olympics in uh, Los Angeles, you know, dripping wet, probably about 150 pounds, uh, scrawny, you know, no luggage, just, feral kids uh from post-punk scene arriving in la and just blown away by the sunshine and the light and the space i went straight to pasadena and played perkins palace that day um that was incredible that was incredible so we have that in our dna and yeah there's been times when we've had our shirts off you know mm -hmm. you're 27 what are you gonna do <laughs> um it's a it's a moment <laughs> it's a moment uh, shirts stay on now, but um, <laughs> we're not in that bad shape. Uh, clean up pretty good, uh, you know. Um, but the con the content is really, you know, what the conversation. I mean, we could go into the psychedelic conversation, which is another theme that definitely weaves itself through. There is a psychedelic component to this record. I'm referencing Ram Z, the artist, the musician, Ram Z. Uh, coined the term gothic futurism and that really that but that was back in 84 maybe he came up with that early 80s but i really feel something that's about that period from just from post-punk probably when the sex pistols split up when it became public image it's joy division into and then what was happening in new york with electro and and hip-hop and the fact that africa bambara did play with john lydon and malcolm mclaren was involved in that there was this magical transference of energy not from the coasts in the united states but from london to new york and it was based on post-punk and reggae reggae was in there as well because we were all around reggae artists as punks in fact they were our first benefactors they took care of us we played in their clubs 
um, in some death caught my first audience was about we played above a uh, we rehearsed above a, a reggae shop called Roots Records in in Bradford. So our first audience was Rastafarians. <laughs> so that all that energy was always there. So we felt very close to Rastafarians. We felt very close with even Krishnas to a degree. A lot of the outsider groups, and then that through McLaren going to the Bronx, seeing Bambata and everything that was happening already already happening there. And then in making Buffalo Gals and the scene started exploding and obviously Cookie Puss and the Beasties and Rick and the whole thing. So in terms of creative gen, you know, that's now been transposed into uh, fashion, the fashion world. I mean, that culture is now, when kids are buying Supreme, they're buying that, you know, it's built on that. And when, you know, hip hop generations are built on that, but it wasn't straight up just straight out of the Bronx. It was coming out of different areas and perspectives and, you know, and it evolved in that way. So it was really interesting. And I, I honestly feel we're in a moment now where it's kind of not some, is there's this so Southern Spain, Northern African connection uh, through London into New York. Los Angeles has its own thing with, uh, you know, Latino, right down from Los Angeles, all the way down to the Amazon, the pyramid, the pyramids and uh, very unique indigenous cultures in the Americas all linking up, you know, and, and our influences from the West Coast. It's a really amazing time for music. And, and then there's the dark wave. It's coming from Berghain in Berlin, you know. There's this, like, Heilung are playing at the Greek, uh, you know, Ramstein are playing at the Rose Bowl. It's like, what? These are huge venues. People are flocking to these events. You've got, you know, like Eve's Tumor. You've got Ethel Kane. Uh, you know, you've got artists around the kind of dark wave, like the Black Rider. Um, you've got uh, so many art, Sun, Southern Lord, Sergeant House, King Woman, this whole area of music, Gothic futurism. And it, there's definitely a connected tissue between that and year 084. And, and then you can flip that back to Brian Jones and Geisen and what they were doing in North Africa. There's a natural lineage even with the Yves Saint Laurent or Pablo Picasso or, you know, Warhol. I mean, we're, we're, we're dining at their tables. We are dining at their tables. They built this and we forget, and that's unfortunate. But um, when you actually, if you have any time to crack open Wild Boys or Junkie or even some Bukowski, I mean, the Bukowski. Bukowski. Was, yep. I met, I, met, I met him once. <laughs> And that was, that was that was sensational to have to be you know to stand that close to to the man and have a conversation with him. But you know, your life is your life. Do not be clubbed into dank submission. Excuse me. Do not be clubbed into dank submission. It's a great line. It's a great line. And I love the electricity that just went all through the world and time as you traced all of that together. It's incredible. Um, well, you know, I, I mean, that's only part of it, as part of it, because there's, a, there's so many other players in the room. I mean, I mean, God, you know, the cult, some death cult. We opened for Bauhaus, see Nico with Bauhaus, then seeing Nico in a club. I'm like the cigarette for her. This is the woman that was the mute, not only the muse, I mean, she was powerful. But Morrison, Brian Jones, we're all blessed by her. You know, so the lineage coming through that, just even being with Nico for that moment. And then fast forward about five, eight years later, I'm in an elevator in London in a hotel. And who's in the elevator with me? The rest of the Velvet Underground. Uh, my son and I got into an elevator with, you know, Maureen Tucker, Sterling Morrison, John Kerr and Lou Reed. They were the only other four people in the elevator. And then the next day we were going down and John Lydon walks out with Bill Siddons, who used to manage the doors. So it put it all together. I don't know. It, it is what it is. Um, and as a wise man once said, that in a quarter will get you a cup of coffee. <laughs> it's a good place probably to, uh, to wrap this up too, because uh, I'll take that cup of coffee a million times over. I will, happily. Excellent, excellent. Ian, uh, Under the Midnight Sun is so much fun to listen to. It's so beautiful, and I love oh, digging into you, it with Kyle. me. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to talk thank, about it. This is always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure to speak with you. 
And now the last time I talked with uh, with Ian was uh, was back in 2019, and, and that was another epic conversation too. Uh, back then we were talking about uh, the 1989 album Sonic Temple. Uh, not only its big rock sound, but also its DNA that intersects with Joy Division and The Doors, a Def Jam, more of the beat authors, uh, the art side of NYC, and then the developing Seattle scene. So I wanted to include that one here for you as well as for uh, part two of Kyle Meredith with Ian Asbury of The Cult. Hi, Kyle. This is Ian Asprey calling. Let, let's see. 30 years of Sonic Temple. It's about to get its big box set release and uh, and, and the ongoing mm. tour along with this. 1989, man. This is, uh, this is quite a while ago. I guess you've had to jump back in this record to get ready for the tour, right? To a degree. I mean, we have been playing some of the songs since they were recorded. There's probably like maybe two or three that we haven't played in our set. And we've Definitely pulled songs out for a while. We pulled out songs like Firewoman, retired them for a couple of years. Songs like Edie, we retired for a few years just to try and keep it fresh, you know. But the intention of this was really, it was kind of twofold. One is that I think at the very core, the cult is a, is a live performance driven band. And we really grew up coming out of club scene into the, you know, post punk, post modern alternative period into kind of evolved into a, you know, went through a, a phase of, uh, well, I wouldn't say it was a phase, <laughs> DNA of, uh, you know, psychedelic and harder rock music, blues based rock music, and then back into sort of postmodern meandering into that. So we've, we've kind of, you know, meandered through the past 30 years. And the intention of this was to continue that as a live band. That's what your principal function is in many ways, and everything that that, you know, implies. And then um, the other idea was that Beggar's Banquet, who are our mother record label in the UK, you know, they wanted to, to do a reissue of the album. And I've never been a great nostalgist or a, a great celebrator of anniversaries. I mean, I think this is the very first time that the cult as an entity has come out and said, we're supporting, acknowledging 30 years of this band, you know, for the first time. And in some ways, we wanted to use Sonic Temple as a platform to link to the DNA of the cult. You know, it's it's a very, very important record in the cult's canon. And we wanted to acknowledge not only the songs on that record, but the influences and um, and how they've kind of continued throughout the last whatever amount of years it's been. <laughs> I'm not keeping count. <laughs> I'm glad you did. Uh, I'm glad you are taking that moment, too, because, it, you know, it, it isn't just one of the, uh, the most important in your own catalog. I think this is one of the the most important records of the 80s. And it did show um, and, and I, I should say beyond the 80s, just the fact that it came out in the 80s. But um, because of what you were saying there, you all had done so many different styles leading into this record. And, and, and maybe this, yes. as it's been written, was one of the first times you sort of doubled down because Electric, I, I guess, had kind of started uh, in that direction. Not that the two records sound alike, but, but it kind of was the first time you said, yeah. you said, all right, let's go further that direction. Why was that? I think it was just a desire to continue to grow, to not repeat ourselves. That was very important. And also to really kind of explore guitar-based, guitar-driven record, explore that side of ourselves a little bit more because it was something that was really blossoming in our live sets. You know, we, I mean, we kind of, when we first started out, we had pretty much two drum beats, a tribal beat and a four, four, four and a floor beat, you know, like everybody else at the time because we all came out of punk rock. Nobody could play. That was a very easy beat to play. Right. And everything was derivative of, I guess, you know, Peter Hook because he wrote these incredible melodies in Joy Division and everybody was like, look, look at what they did. You know, we can apply that to what we do. So we kind of evolved out of that. And at that time, you know, if you look at the images or you know anything about the band, Sudden Death Cult, Theory of Hate, mm -hmm. that period, it was a really interesting time. It was almost like, you know, Britain was in a very, it was in a political upheaval you know, the campaign for nuclear disarmament was, was in full swing. It was just pre-1984. It was just pre-Orwellian. You know, there was a band called Crass who were doing a countdown every album. They would do it, you know, like four years to 1984, three years to 1984, <laughs> and then they split up in 1984, kind of signifying in many ways that, that uh, 1984 was year zero. You know, it was like the end of the 20th, 20th century and it kind of the beginning of the 21st century. So I guess in some ways seeing a lot of this culture was being discarded after the post-punk and punk movement, which kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater in many ways, you know, like 
blues music kind of went away for a minute and as a, as a major influence in rock music and um, something was all very important to me and um, we wanted to incorporate that more into it and plus the psychedelic influences um, you know psychedelic in the broadest terms everything from Pink Floyd to even the Gun Club you know who were sort of a, had a, a psychedelic uh, it's certainly a desert peyote essence you know uh, what Jeffrey was conjuring up so we were just making it up as we went along. There was no rules. And when people told us there was rules, it was like, absolutely not. I mean, when we made the transition from, from death cult to the cult, people were like, what? What are you guys doing? It was like, we're done with that. That's finished. We've done it. And the whole movement was kind of, it, you know, it was fizzling out. It was fizzling out. And there was so much more happening. MTV was coming up. And 1984 was the year that Ridley Scott did the Olympic commercial with the girl throwing a javelin. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very Orwellian dystopian you know people at the desk and this javelin and we arrived at la in la in 1984 the opening day of the olympics so it's kind of like the beginning of apple beginning from computers the beginning we could sort of see the 21st century coming and the 60s seemed so far away and it was such a taboo to dive into 60s music but there were these kind of fringe clubs in london where everybody would gather, and I mean everybody, you'd see like everybody from, you know, Jeffrey Lee Pierce to Blixer Bargeld to Susie Sue to Robert Smith, they all played this club called Alice in Wonderland, which was a psychedelic rock club. And all they played was everything probably like, I want to say 65 through 71. But it was really choice psychedelic cuts like a lot of great British bands. I mean, what, Pink, what Nick Mason is doing right now with Saucer Full mm -hmm. of Secrets mm -hmm. was kind of the essence of the club. And it was an incredible energy because it was like so unlike anything else that was happening in art and music at that time, because it, it wasn't so much revisionist. It was just like, I guess, the archetypal elements of, you know, this, the late 60s and the early 70s rock bands, what they were, they were seemed to be much more connected to the soil and the, the ether. You know, they were, the, the information was coming in through different channels. It wasn't coming through the internet. It wasn't coming through the phones. You had to actually go out and experience it. Like uh, a lot of the songs were written through travel, you'd go to a place and then you'd be inspired and, you know, you weren't sitting at home imagining what it'd be like through a book or a computer, you know, you'd, you'd go see it through your own eyes and I think it was just a continuation for the cult. So, yeah, I mean, I was always pushing for something new, something different, something fresh. And Sonic Temple was a moment where, I guess, a lot of things converged, a lot of, a lot of uh, <clears throat> influences converged. And, um, you know, we were very well aware of what was happening in Seattle. We'd had a, a relationship with Seattle since, like, 85, 86, we played the Paramount Theater in Seattle. Seashell Sanctuary was a top 40 hit in Seattle, which mm -hmm. was strange because the rest of the country it wasn't. It's more of a college situation. Uh, college radio and like people like K-Rock were playing it. And so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot in it. Yeah. <laughs> there's a well, lot in it. So I, I was going to kind of seg there for a second, too, because Firewoman ended up in the movie Singles, you know, based in Seattle with Cameron Crowe there. So genre, as we're kind of hitting around here, was really important back then we, we talk about it differently today than we did back then like when you in, in the course. fan scene you were either a punk or a metalhead or a goth or you know an alternative whatever it was way more, it was far more niche right far more niche but but yeah. but the yeah. cult seemed to be the bridge to to do you know be on tour with metallica and also to be accepted by the seattle guys you know in in this coming of age movie that's meant a lot to that scene too uh i mean were yeah what did that look like to you at that moment did 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 you see it like that it was kind of strange because we like i said you know coming through um post-punk punk scene you're coming more out of an urban environment i mean we we came out of london the band was formed in brixton you know our neighbor nick cave lived around the corner mm -hmm. um you know the clash the clash lived close uh, Cosmo Vinyl, the guys who worked with Clash and Flea, the road crew, they all lived in vicinity, proximity to where we lived, you know. So we didn't, I don't think we were that self-conscious. It was really more about like discovering the new music that was coming up and, and just really fans. I mean, going to see bands play, like seeing Soundgarden at the Lingerie in 1988 or seeing Mother Love Bone before they came Pearl Jam, got close to Andrew, got close to Chris Cornell, those, seeing those guys. And they had very similar ideology. I mean, you know, it would have been very interesting to see what would happen with Mother Love Bone had they continued with Andrew because they were way more glam. I mean, they were... Mm -hmm. We saw them opening for Dogs the More. You know, they were like really glam rock. I mean, it was more like T-Rex. It was more like Freddie Mercury. You know, like Queen mixed with punk. I mean, it was very interesting music. And it was, it was so incredibly exciting and dangerous, you know, because you go out in the street dressed in your finery, you're an immediate target for, you know, any kind of negative attention. So, um, I mean, we were traveling all over the world as well. So, and plus our history, our lineage, 
um, some death call. I was opening for the Clash, Bauhaus. You know, we did shows with New Order, festivals. You know, festivals with Nick Cave on the bill. Um, Gun Club was on the bill. Um, you know, and and then it just kind of evolved. The scene kind of evolved. It kind of, I think, psychedelic music, psychedelic rock. Probably the Doors was a very important connected tissue because the Doors really go. You talk about a bridge. The Doors really had everything in there. They had like hard blues. They had, you know, at times it could be hard rock and uh, you know, folk, Spanish, flamenco, mm-hmm. um, you know, classical, jazz. I mean, with so many, you know, some of the songs were very brutal, brutal, <laughs> completely brutal, pagan primal and then some of the songs are incredibly sophisticated and then they have moments of absolute beatific you know they really reached the zenith they did grab the sun you know and that i think there was such an important band i know in liverpool in 1980 one of the bands that was most influential and you could see that in like echo and the bunny man for oh, example right. yeah of course and teardrop explodes was the doors the doors were a very very important band in 1980 post-apocalypse now so you know that was that was kind of a, an indicator I think for a lot of where we were going, because we were kind of like, I guess the guidebooks were the biographies that were written. We were and meeting people in the flesh. I mean, we opened for Iggy Pop in I don't know what '86, '87. Then we went and opened for Bowie, and then we, you know, we did a tour with GNR opening for us, and that was an incredible year for for you know talk about diverse crisscrossing genres. I think it really changed when MTV decided to come up with 120 minutes, headbangers, oh. ball, yo MTV raps. They really began to segregate the genres, which wasn't the truth because when we were making Electric with Rick Rubin, we were immersed in the Def Jam world in their universe, you know, and we're always hanging out with whomever was around, you know, like meeting Ella Cool Jam who was 19 or, you know, hanging out with the Beasties or just being around hip hop and rock were way more together. In fact, the call, I think three years ago, we did a couple of shows of Public Enemy, which really, to me, made a lot of sense. But, um, I think it was just fat, really, ultimately, the, the, probably the, the bonding factor is fans of music, you know. And then somebody says, well, actually, you're, you have your own fans. You'd be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> How's that possible? I'm busy focused on getting the music, going to the shows. I mean, I was I still have a voracious appetite to discover new music. It's just what's in the day, you know. It's, that's what that's what gets me out of bed. Is when you hear an artist who's really engaged in what they're, in their craft and they're doing it in a fully focused, fully realized way, you know, with no apparent agenda other than to make an excellent piece of work. And I don't know what the inspiration. For example, you know, Tom York's uh, Anima, mm-hmm. which I love. I mm-hmm. think it's, it's, a, it's a genius. He is, he is a brilliant man, an incredibly sensitive man, and I um, admire him greatly. There's so many great records have been made, like, you know, Tyler's Igor, brilliant, brilliant. You know, Billy Ellish is amazing. You know, there's so many incredible artists right now. Like, we were them at some point in our career. We were like, you know, teens, evolving into young men, evolving into, you know, adult males. And we grew up on the road, traveling around capital cities throughout the world, you know. And um, by the time we were 25 or 26, we were, we were pretty burnt, you know. And, you you know, we were reading No One Here Gets Out Alive. It's <laughs> one of the Bibles that were floating around. And then eventually getting to meet Danny Sugarman and, and be immersed in the world of the doors with Manzarek and Krieger and, you know, and then going forward. But in many ways, that record was kind of like the tent pole that connected so many different areas, which was evident when we did Gathering of the Tribes, mm-hmm. because that was kind of like an opportunity for me to say, here's some context as to where I think it's at. And um, a lot of people seem to agree with it, perhaps not uh, consciously, but certainly in terms of the energy of what you know, we were trying to create with Gathering of the Tribes. In many ways, it was a window, again, you know, a gateway into the 21st century, so... And you nailed it. I mean, it was perfectly on, you know, on the spot, you know, everybody that was a part of that. that was it was a, it was an amazing, very quickly, because, I mean, I came up with the idea in um, Rapid City, South Dakota. We were opening for Metallica. And out of that and the love affair with, with indigenous American culture and what was happening in the media, MTV, Life magazine had just done a piece on what, you know, um, subcultures are going to look like going into the 1990s. They were telling us, the marketers were telling us what it's going to be like. We were no longer 
along to telling people what it was going to be mm-hmm. like, you know, the audience. And that. we're being told, I mean, that the, the advertising agencies and the marketers and the, you know, the, the A&R people have got, got incredibly sophisticated. They became embedded with artists and they began to influence almost like Jesuits or something, you know. They came into these communities of like raw creatives and started to influence their commercial doctrine. And, um, you know, saw, kind of saw it coming. It, was, it felt very Machiavellian and sinister and what MTV were trying to do, you know, to cut up, right? You're getting segregated now. Yo MTV raps and, and 120 minute, you know, headbangers ball. You guys are separate. It's like, well, wait a minute. We're not, <laughs> you know, right. we're not separate. We're all the same age. We'll come from, we may come from different backgrounds or different environments, but we've definitely got a lot in common with each other. So I saw that coming and I was like, that doesn't feel right. That We have to kind of grab our community back, our musical community. And of course, you know, inspired by so many things. Going to Live Aid was a huge inspiration in 1985, being at Live Aid, sitting between Bob Geldof and Billy Conley when Queen were on stage um, in one of the boxes overlooking the stadium. How can that not be an influence on, right. on, a, on a 24-year-old, you know, 25-year-old kid? Actually, no, I was young. I was 23. I mean, that blew my mind. I could never seen anything like that before. The response, the audience responding, the visceral energy was just profound. And the unity and the sense of shared cause, you know, cause, C-A-U-S-E, um, not, not cause the artist, K-A-W-S. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of put into, I mean, one of the things for the cult is it's always been people sit down and go like, you guys are full of contradictions. And go like, yeah, I guess we are. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah constantly you know i love that there's a great interview with david bowie where the interviewer says i think it might be russell hart he says to him he says isn't that pretentious and bowie just turned around and goes like i've always been pretentious <laughs> darling you know and that was the kind of attitude it's like yeah it's contradictory we are contradictory that we're not doing it as a shtick it's a, there's an absolute sincere passion for music and culture and film and art and photography and acting and all the, all the crafts, all the visual arts, painting. There's a convergence of energy. I mean, we came of age at a time when we went to New York in 84 when Bowie, sorry, when um, Warhol and Basquiat were still active, you know, and we, we dropped into that. We played, the first gig we played in New York was at the Danceteria and it was a Puerto Rican dance night, part, a Puerto Rican party, and there was all these Puerto Rican kids <laughs> There and I was going like, what is this? This isn't our music. And we were like, we're sorry, we just we got booked this night. This is it. <laughs> but it was amazing to be immersed into that, you know, into that diversity, into that you know, how complex it became in terms of cultural diverse images. And I was always breaking off to try and see artists like John Lee Hooker or Jerry Lee Lewis or Chuck Berry or, you know, whomever you could grab these great iconic unicorns, you know, Bob Dylan as well at the time, you know, to see them, to see them perform and how magnificent they were, you know, just in in terms of raw energy. And, you know, it was just exhilarating. And that's kind of what keeps me going, I guess, in some ways is discovery, you know, uh, just a voracious appetite for being inquisitive. And a lot of of times you, you come up against people that will tell you, individuals that will tell you how it should be and that you've crossed over some lines which you shouldn't be crossing over. And it's like, well, who are you to say? What's your credentials? <laughs> you know, what are your credentials? Please, <laughs> please. What are you basing this upon? It's not a science project. You know, you hit New York there and I knew that was kind of important going into this record. They, I should note that uh, that same year that you all put out Sonic Temple, you were also on uh, Derry, uh, Debbie Harry's uh, record, uh, backing her up on the on Love Light. Speaking of New York, it's, it's yeah. hard to get more New York than that. No, that was, I mean, that was kind of strange how that came about. I think it was Rodney uh, Bingenheimer introduced me to uh, Chris and, and uh, Debbie and they were making Debbie was doing a record with Mike Chapman I believe producing it was very important because it produced a lot of British glam bands like Sweet stuff like that uh, so a great British producer lauded producer and it was really interesting um, being around Chris and Debbie I mean an incredibly charismatic couple and um, incredibly high level of emotional intelligence certainly authentic and um I was always looking for mentorship. I sent, I think in some ways, I always really enjoyed meeting artists who were a little bit older than me, mm-hmm. that had more experience. And I just, I just asked them a thousand questions. I just was always interested in, I still am, the opportunity to sit down with any artist and who's had a, a, a decent amount of time in it and, and done a, you know, a good body of work. And you ask them questions, how do they maintain that harmonic balance between creativity and washing the dishes, you know? <laughs> it's like, I'm going to be a student. I'll be a student till the day I die. I don't definitely haven't mastered the craft yet, but yeah, it's like you're always in pursuit of that perfect piece, and and then you you make something you think's really good, and then you listen to it over and over and over again, and you're like, 
uh, this could change. Uh, I should have done it that way. And then, but then you're into something else. So, you know, right. just keep moving. And that's, I guess, one of the lessons I picked up along the road was like, don't, don't, don't drive the car looking in the rear view mirror. You know? If you're constantly looking at the past for your answers, you're going to get stuck because the environment's changed. The way we communicate has changed. Being present in the present moment is, is a real gift to be able to receive the information and put it through your own filter. And there's, a, there's an incredible amount of creativity happening right now. You know, it's just everybody is doing something creative. I, I don't know anybody, certainly in my circle of friends, who are not creatives. All the different stages of career development, you know. Some people have been around for a while. Some people are just coming up. Um, all in different fields as well. Mm. You know, photography, art, filmmaking, music, uh, fashion. But they all share the same passion and a desire to create. And a desire to make the world a better place as well. A desire to address what is happening environmentally in, in society. You know, everyone seems to be really motivated to, to get this thing together. And I think that was one of the ideals of the late 60s generation, certainly Jim Morrison, was a sense of communion, unity, uh, ritual space, you know, and create an energy that can transcend, you know, this Western industrial complex conditioning that we're all get stuck in. And uh, I'm very excited about what's happening, in, uh, especially on the West Coast. The West Coast is... West Coast is on fire right now in terms of um, like the, the energy in LA is, is incredible. I lived in New York for, for I've lived in New York in the eighties, the nineties, and the aughts, and uh, you know for different periods of time. Last time I lived there for nearly four and a half years, and um, New York was until you know the, the glass and concrete went up and rent, rents became insane. New York was it, and New York was mecca. But LA, I guess a lot of refugees from New York and other cultural capitals started to gravitate towards LA because it was a lot cheaper. To, easier, you know, cheaper lives. It, it's definitely changing now, but there's so many galleries, there's so many events. I mean, you're spoiled for choice. Yeah. Spoiled for choice. That's like in my immediate vicinity, I live between the Hollywood Bowl and the Fonda Theater. Just, you know, there's so much going on. Yeah, when I heard... Um... I talked to Kim Gordon not too long ago when I heard that, you know, she had left New yeah. York for L.A. And, and was doing just as much art out there. I was like, oh, yeah, no, that's you could tell that was the, that that's part of the sea change right there. That's a, a telltale yeah, absolutely. sign. And, that, and that's wonderful because Kim Gordon's a visionary creative. And uh, I really like her paintings. I think her paintings uh -huh. are excellent. Absolutely. Um, actually, during um, when we did Sonic Temple, we were doing a TV show, like a filmed interview. I'm not quite sure where it was, but um I was there in like all the dope clothes I was wearing at the time, like yeah. totally done out. And uh, they walked out of this interview situation and I was like, oh, wow, such an honor to meet you guys. I love Daydream Nation. And I was just really, you know, I was pretty struck that they were standing right in front of me because I really admire them. And then when the interviewer sat down and said, uh, said, yeah, I showed them the Firewoman video. I said, did you like it? They were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Oh, that was a drag. But then again, I, I understood. I understood why they, they, that might not fit in with their, you know, their, their view of, of culture and what it should be. But I think right now we've got to get into a place where artists, anybody who's doing something creative, we, that we unify, that we, there's not this kind of, Jesus Christ, intellectual bullying going on. You know, nobody knows more than anybody else. If you're, if you, if you're, if you're sensitive in any way, you can learn so much from other people and just listen. And, you know, there's always a different perspective and it can enhance your own, your, your, your own perspective and your own lifestyle and affect very positively in a way around you. I used to go out my way to go into environments that were, you know, supposedly off limits. Like during Sonic Temple tour, the rave culture was coming up in the UK and I was going out to clubs, rave clubs and events. The energy was incredible and the music was changing as well, shifting, you know, Stan Roses were on the horizon and um, Happy Mondays and Charlatans and Spiral Carpets. Primal Scream were doing incredible work, still are. Um, it's a really vibrant scene. Bands like The Orb, you know, you know just pre, pre-massive attack. It was such an exciting time to go out, and that's where the energy was. And uh, I remember going to the Hacienda. Pete Hook actually took me to the Hacienda, and I was, like, dressed in, like, leather pants and cowboy hat, you know. And I walked in. I was only, like, 26 or something. And I walked in, and I felt so old. I was like, what? What is this? <laughs> Everyone's wearing, like, you know, dope haircuts, sneakers. And, and I was like, this is like New York. It's just jamming. It's rammed. It's, the energy was incredible. So I'd be sneaking off to these clubs and then going on stage and performing, you know, with a cult and then hitting whatever joint we could find, you know, three, four, five in the morning and uh, just immersing myself in that kind of hip-hop shows, you know. We used to blast NWA through the PA before we went on stage every night, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's just, it's like we're going to set a tone here. This is something we're really into. And, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I guess, 
a lot of context around the cult that haven't really, or I think we're getting more into it now because mm-hmm. we're getting some more, there's a little bit of revisionism going on right now, you know. People are going, they did it first. And they're like, well, actually, not quite. They did it after a lot of other people did a lot of incredible work. I mean, nobody has the right to any real estate, cultural real estate in this. Everyone's been influenced by somebody, and that's okay. It's completely healthy to be open to other information than, than what you deem as, you know, what's going on in your head. It it's, just continues. It continues. It's not, it's not hard to draw, you know, the line from, you know, you all listening to NWA to, to what how the witch ended up sounding. Of course. With the drum loops yeah, and, you and got stuff it. like that. Yeah, it's, it makes perfect sense. It's not brain science. You know, it's not brain <laughs> surgery. You know, I mean, yeah, Rick Rubin produced the track. Matt Dyke, who did Paul's Boutique, who was a brilliant brilliant producer in fact we cut that track he he cut the beats and i used to hang out in matt's studio and in matt's studio santa monica boulevard were baskets lined up against the wall all these because he was friends with jean michel yeah, wow. so it was all incredible basket so that was made in that environment this funky studio in santa monica boulevard surrounded by baskets and wow. the beats kind of came from that and i learned the song that appeared in 94 called naturally high but that was it we just wanted to get that the street sound i mean both billy and i grew up in some pretty rough industrialized neighborhoods at various times of our lives. You know, sometimes we live in the suburban areas where you get the overspill from the major city situation, but we lived in some pretty gritty places. And um, when you get to New York, that was such an accelerator of that energy. And, you know, that's for me where the energy was. So I loved NWA. I thought they were incredible when they came out. And Public Enemy and Run DMC. Africa Van Bar. I love Africa Van Bar. Thank, thank you to Malcolm McLaren for that all that. Sweet Soul Sister, wake up time for freedom. You know, when you're talking about connecting the past to the present, it, it seems like, you know, there's a couple tracks right there. Uh, different than what we're talking about musically. That's more thematically. Like, do you see those yeah. songs speaking to anything specific today? Well, certainly archetypal elements in the song. I mean, the idea of a city as a feminine entity, you yeah, know, Sweet Soul Sister, the idea of the philosophy and revolutionary culture that is a that has emanated from Paris post situationism, the love of jazz music, all these incredible elements that were woven together, and this idea that the city has its own essence and that's a feminine, very strong feminine energy and a myst- there's a myst- mystique there to that. I think it's a subject I've always been interested in is exploring going beyond cognition, you know, the, the ego's cognition, and moving into much more, uh, I guess, essentially based gathering of information where it's it's intuitive and um, some of these things just kind of grow out of an intuition. I couldn't really break it all down. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a, um, a quantum <laughs> physics <laughs> uh, scientist or anything like that. So, um, but it was definitely picking up on the energy and the essences of cities, and also I guess cinema. Cre- trying to create things that were visceral, visually would create visual. The, your visual, the, your visual cortex would be start vibrating with this music as well, and maybe some of the words and the phrases would would, would bring up certain images. But I, I guess you could link if you were you know clever enough, you could sit back and link a lot of the lines to things that are happening politically and social politically right now in, in in the world. I mean, the idea of Sonic Temple, Sonic Temple was for me was always the idea that yes, it's entertainment. Yes, it's entertainment. You pay you pay for a ticket, you go through the door, you know, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But there's a moment when all that kind of fades away, when when you hit the stage and you can get this sense, this essence of an anticipation from an audience. And you, you get that there's an opportunity to do something together that night in this kind of ritual space. And I, sometimes I say to the audience, like, what have you got to say? Get it out right now. Here's your opportunity. Here's your opportunity to be unfiltered and to let it go. And everybody's safe. Everybody is welcome in this space. We take care of each other in, in our space. I always want to reiterate that our concerts are open to everyone, any walk of life. We don't segregate in that way. So um, I think that's kind of woven through the songs. Wake Up Time for Freedom. It's just like, that, that's like a, a Buddhist tenant, you know, wake up. A dream, you know, the form is formless, formlessness is form, you know, a dream within a dream. Um, I was picking up more Buddhist texts um, through the beats, through Alan Watts, through Timothy Leary, through Ginsburg, through, the, you know, Burroughs, through Joseph Campbell. Hero of a Thousand Faces, the interviews he did with Bill Moyer, you know, The Myth of Freedom, uh, Trogium Trompa Rinpoche. It was all this incredible esoteric knowledge that was coming through, especially on public television. You know, these great interviews with Bill Moyers and, and just becoming more interested in the architects of the subculture. Like when you actually go like, yeah, you have your very commercial end with your Woodstocks and all that kind of thing. But you actually look at the, the individuals who kind of fired this all up. You know, it's like, why do hippies have long hair? Everyone's like, well, you know, they, they were like, you know, influenced by Native Americans 
Indians and that kind of thing. Yes, they were. But one of the big reasons that hippies had long hair is because there's dignitaries from Cuba after the revolution went to Berkeley and they were photographed in Life magazine. I think it was like Camilo C. and Fuegas and might have been Che Guevara. They had long hair and beard. And everyone was like, what? <laughs> they look stunning. You know, and that was a massive picture in life. And then all of a sudden people start to affect that look on the Berkeley campus, you know, the long hair look and the beard and the beat neck kind of thing. And then that just evolved. It just became a cultural trend. And, um, you know, so there's so many tributaries and points of you know entry points and i'd like to think that some of those have woven through into into our into our songs and there are layers and there are text there, it was intended there, there was an intention to try and create something that had layers that could be peeled away that you could there's, there's room for discovery in the music you know not all of it some of it was just pretty blatantly street fight <laughs> <laughs> you know it was to create a, a you know an immediate adrenal response but um i think a great amount of travel and thought and consideration went into it and um, we didn't always get it right I mean it's not Sonic Temple's imperfect imperfect in many ways it has many imperfections but it is what it is and you know there it is the Sonic Polaroid of cult circa 88 through 91 that record you know it's created its own space outside of us that people have a, and in, you know so many people I've met at our shows come up and they, they share what an important record it was for them in their lives and that it still evokes certain moods and sentiments when they put it on it's absolutely fascinating to hear all of these as as you said at the beginning of the interview that you wanted to talk about the influences and, and to hear how many different types of influences all went in to make this record sound what it did i mean it's um to me it's just it, you know at at its base level it's a great rock record but to hear cool. how deep everything goes is really amazing no, it's not, you know, and people like, you know, the fucking Brian Jones, you know, when he went to Morocco and the uh, master musicians of Jujuku, you know, things like that. And then woven into the beats of Burroughs and woven into like Dyson and Paul Bowles and the literary crossovers and, the, you know. There was just so many. Brian Jones was always a very important figure to me. I always felt that he was, if he'd continued, he would have made some magnificent work. A magnificent, you know. Pink Floyd were a band that I actually saw in 1975, and they were always kind of constantly around. And I never thought of them as an influence, but they've actually been a major part of my life. You know, when I go, when I listen to it, I think, how many times have I sat down and listened to Dark Side of the Moon or Animals? I don't know. Thousands, perhaps. You know, countless. Wish you were here. I mean, and you know, at my heart, mother. So it's just incredible. And all that goes has has found its way through, albeit you know, through our dilettante fingers. <laughs> you know, um, you know, we came out of punk rock. What, what can we say? I didn't go to a music conservatory. I was self-taught, and uh, you know, very much like Tom Sachs as an artist. <laughs> we throw this together, and it, it somehow it, it it manages to to create. A, you know. Um, it connects in some ways, and it's not for everybody, and I wouldn't expect it to be. But um, hopefully, hopefully this tour. I mean, it's, it's been an incredible response because it's selling out. We, we did the Greek, which was, you know, we did nearly six six thousand. I think the Greek sold that out. The UK tour selling out. Canadian tour sold out. Which for us, we're kind of going, what? <laughs> what? I mean, we were doing pretty good before. It was like, you know, we were doing we were doing good. We we're doing like probably ninety percent across the board uh, in terms of you know packing venues out. But this tour has been, I think, because we said it up as a sonic temple not the sonic temple a sonic temple meaning a sonic temple is this place it's an idea it's it requires your participation as much as our performance otherwise it's it's not, it's not just going to come it's not going to come off you know it just won't come off so and then it's like i'm just viewing it as like a sonic temple an evening with the cult revealing the dna of their influences or something like that it's exciting i i, I do want to see one of these shows I need to come to the if you UK. really want to see it if you really want to see it, the greek was excellent but I think that if you really want to see Sonic Temple in its in contextual environment, London Hammersmith Apollo, as it's called now, mm -hmm. used to be called the Hammersmith Odeon, where Bowie did Spiders on Mars and Ziggy Stardust, the last concert was done there. You know, that's the place to see it because that venue particularly was a venue that was very important for Billy and I. We used to go out a lot when we first got together and we'd go see everybody from Johnny Thunders to Iggy Pop to... I mean, you know, Susan the Banshees um, at the Hammersmith Apollo. An incredible venue, incredible venue. And um, when is so that show? It's like October the 25th or something oh, like that. That's October totally 26th. doable. Yeah, um, that'll be a good one. 
but there's never there's never any guarantees, you know. Right. I mean, I remember walking out on the House Smith Odium one show I did not that long ago, and I ran out on stage and my pants ripped open. I was like, ah, oh, shit, you're kidding me. Just since the first song, I actually literally had to run off the stage and find another pair of trousers. And the only trousers I had, other than my stage pants, at the time I could find were like a pair of like, you know, drop crotch sweatpants. And I ran out and people were like, what is he wearing? You know, and people actually commented like, he looked terrible. He was like dressed in his casual clothes. And it's like, needless to they know that my ass was hanging out. Yeah, um, but that, that really affected the show, not having the right trousers. Uh, yeah, yeah. that. You gotta have to write sure. trousers. Quick, quick note cool. here that I just noticed. By the way, uh, the Doors, because we talked about them so much. Uh, a little side note to the interview yeah. here. Uh, today is the 50th anniversary of the Soft Parade. Fantastic. Yes, the Monk bought lunch. <laughs> the great line. The yeah. great, great line. I uh, said, so "What an incredible line! The best what an part. amazing line! The, the Monk part. bought lunch." Yeah. What? That's <laughs> oh, an incredible record. It's the best part of the trip. Uh, best Ian, part of the trip. Yeah. This has been so much fun. Uh, cool. Thank you so, cool. so much for taking the moment, uh, time today. Today. Thank you, sir. All right. We'll see you around. Actually, we'll see you down the road somewhere. All yeah, right. Take care. And my thanks to Ian Asbury. The uh, new album from the Colts is called Under the Midnight Sun. And thanks to you for uh, checking out the episode. Before you get out, please, again, hit that subscribe button so you can catch all the interviews that I send out every week, new and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to keep you up to date on your favorite artists and discover some new ones at iTunes, Apple Podcasts, at Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, YouTube for the video versions, or anywhere you get your podcasts from. Subscribe to Kyle Meredith with. Then after that, head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. An hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. Of course, you can also catch me on the uh, social media spots, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all three of them. The address is at Kyle Meredith. I do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network. Take care, bye-bye. It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at wfpk.org from Louisville Public Media.